so double feature, why? Because uh, I'm still working on way too many things at once. So uh, I worked on uh, the first part of this talk, to cache or not to cache, slightly over a year, a year ago. Who is using OpenBSD regularly in this room? Yeah, you probably noticed the results <laughs> because it is a huge improvement in speed. And uh, I worked on some other things a bit more recently for various reasons. Uh, among other things, the fact is that I, I have a student who is interested in working on that, on package tools and stuff. And it turns out to be remarkably complicated to extend everything to him. So I'm trying to make things slightly simpler, uh, which is a challenge, of course. So yeah, that's the second part. So let's start for real. <coughs> so uh, we are talking about a year ago, like I said. Uh, and uh, for those of you not familiar with OpenBSD packages, we do just-in-time updates. This is something that was designed almost from the start. Uh, so instead of downloading a whole list of packages and everything, we open a package that's a possible candidate for update. We look at meta information, and we decide whether we want to update or not. This has some advantages and some drawbacks. The main advantage is that uh, it's really hard to fail because we run out of big space or memory or something like that, because we don't keep too much information in memory at once. Uh, also, there's some design concerning package names, which means that it's usually easy to find updates, with some exceptions, because people tend to rename things when they shouldn't. Uh, so assuming we need an update, we are going to first extract the new package, then delete the old one, and then install the new package for real. Uh, this is uh, kind of different from other systems where usually it's a bit of, uh, okay, let's try to update, and if it doesn't work out, we are going to back out and go back uh, to the previous installation. Instead, we try to prove that the installation is going to work just fine. Specifically, for instance, we extract everything first, so that we are sure we have enough memory, enough, sorry, this space for the new package. And then we delete the old one, and then we finish the installation. So uh, at almost no point in time do we have a broken installation. Um, so if we are not updating, we are just closing the connection and moving to the next one. Uh, this has its own set of compromises and issues. Uh, we could try to add some uh, specialized uh, connector to the outside world, but we decided not to do so for security reasons. It's much simpler to have something like FTP, the command, uh, that connects to the outside world, and so I don't have to deal with uh, TLS security issues, for instance. And uh, also, we can completely preset this part, actually, for a year and a half, no, more than that. Uh, FTP has run as a completely unprivileged user, as opposed to the rest. Uh, should probably go a bit faster. <coughs> so this meta information that's used for updates looks like this. Uh, this is what you have in a uh, normal package. Uh, this was Debus two years ago. Uh, so you know where it comes from, so that you can check whether or not uh, you are actually upgrading Debus or something else. And you got uh, some meta information like creating users and shit. And then you have the actual files. Uh, so this is the full information from the packing list, but not so. This is the source information. When you get full package creates, it's going to annotate it with a lot of other things, like for instance, dependency information, which is computed dynamically each time you create a new package. So in that case, uh, you gain a set of font lib, libs from the system and from the port tree that were used to compile the bus. And when you are going to look at updating the bus, of course, you're going to upgrade the bus each time one of those library version changes. And also some uh, actual run dependency information that I don't think I have any on the bus, for whatever reason. Oh yeah, and uh, a few years ago, we also added a big hammer called version, uh, at version in the second line. <laughs> Uh, which you can actually bump each time you change something in the base system, that means all packages with binary stuff should be updated. Like for instance, if you change your C++ compiler and the mangling of base types changes, 
like for instance, if you move the force IST from unsigning to unsigning, which happened in the past, uh, then you don't have to go through the post tree and update each and every single package that depends on that information. Uh, and also, from time to time, we get the same problem with some architectures. <coughs> yeah, so it's a bit long, of course. So how does it work programming-wise? Uh, so packing lists are structured information. It's created by a constructor, several constructors, which usually read the information from files, parses them, and create a list of uh, various objects. Uh, each object is a member of a base class called packing element. Uh, yeah, I know it's uh, not original for a name. And uh, you have complex objects sometimes which have information which is uh, in several lines. Like for instance, a file can have a name, extra modes, an actual checksum, a timestamp. Uh, we used to store timestamps in the tar archive, but we no longer do so, which means that there is less variation of tarballs, which is great when you want to <coughs> synchronize stuff over rsync, actually, and ownership, of course. Uh, this will come to bite us later. Like, uh, it would be very nice if uh, each uh, packing element was on a single line, but it's not. Well, it's not going to be a big problem anyway, spoilers. <coughs> so, uh, it's object oriented. Anything file related is a file object. And uh, all annotations are a member of a meta class. And uh, since reading a packing list is somewhat expensive, creates a whole hierarchy of objects, uh, we have some specific methods that can read only part of the packing list. So for instance, when you're looking at update information, you get usually the complete packing list, but you only look at the meta information that's needed to be able to decide whether you want to update or not. So basically, you want the name of a package, you want everything that looks like a dependency, and uh, since those are ordered in the packing list, as soon as you encounter an annotation that's definitely not, not part of dependency information, you can stop early. This is uh, line seven. If you encounter new group or new user or CWD, you know that you have stopped reading dependency information and nothing else is of interest to you. So uh, speed was Always an issue, but it was becoming more and more so. Uh, to decide which candidates to consider for update, uh, you look at names. Uh, in most cases, you will look at one single package. In some cases, it would be way more awkward. Like for instance, we've got all autoconf versions in the tree. So this means that uh, whenever you want to, to upgrade autoconf, you need to look at 17 different packages, which takes quite a while. Uh, it was not such a big problem 10 years ago because we didn't have uh, really fast networks and uh, very often bandwidth was an issue, so taking less bandwidth was the most important part of this day, except in Africa and other places. Uh, we have lots of bandwidth, but we still have very slow one trip times comparatively. So this means that uh, opening connections and closing connections uh, is taking more and more uh, its toll when you are doing this kind of stuff. And so PackageJet got slow. Well, it was always slow, but <laughs> it felt slower with the recent network. Uh, also, we got a CDN thanks to Jobs. Uh, so, yeah, we use HTTP and HTTPS. Uh, it can be a bit slower. Uh, the first connection is actually a redirect to the actual site. And uh, PackageJet already looks at this and caches the connection to the actual site for sharing reason. You see, there is a, a star there. Uh, the star is because what's sharing? Uh, you've got to consider that a full snapshot of packages is roughly 60 gigabytes these days. So uh, updating from one snapshot to the next one on the mirror is not instantaneous. And if you're really unlucky, uh, you will end up having, uh, having half an old snapshot and half a new snapshot, which can be an issue. 
so at least trying to make sure that for a given update, you are always on the same mirror. It's already a, a big improvement. Uh, we got safeguards, like if you get a shared snapshot, uh, you will get uh, lots of insults from packages. So I'm French, so there are insults, of course. Uh, that tell you, uh, you that uh, something bad is happening. Uh, one future goal is to try to make it uh, a bit less intimidating. Uh, right now, all the information is useful to me, but it could be shortened so that the average users would know instantly that it's just a shared snapshot and nothing really bad is happening. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk against HTTPS because for packages, it's not a good idea at all. Uh, our packages are already signed, so we have absolutely zero authentication issue that uh, HTTPS would solve. But on the other hand, if you know your network, you know that HTTPS tends to be a bit slower than pure uh, HTTP at establishing connections. Because you usually need to grab some credentials from the client and uh, exchange keys and everything. Uh, it's supposed to be faster with TLS 1.3, assuming that everything supports TLS 1.3 to the required level. Uh, last time I tried to play with TLS, it was something like two years ago, some of the mirrors were definitely not up to speed. Stuff like session resumption, for instance, was not working on at least two or three mirrors. Uh, and like I said, we have package signatures, so I'm not going to talk about that because I already talked about that a few years ago. Uh, but this means that uh, more or less, uh, apart from giving good habits to our users, enforcing good habits, uh, HTTPS won't uh, gain us anything with respect to actually grabbing the right packages. So the big problem is grabbing this update information uh, from each package, uh, not storing anything. And possibly uh, there was the idea of doing an experiment, trying to cache it somewhere that would speed things up. But there is a chicken and egg problem because we already have an installation in production. And it will make sense only if we actually test the that the caching information is good. But in order to do that, I have to coerce convince my fellow developers that they should produce caches for snapshots. And then I would have to write the code to test it. And also, we don't have any uh, database tools in the build system. So uh, if you have 10,000 packages and you want to cache uh, information for each and every one of them, how are you going to store them? At some point, we had uh, SQLite in the build system, but it was thrown out for I would say spurious reasons. And also it did not help me because uh, that code is still Perl and uh, having SQLite is not enough. You also have to have the wall enchilada of uh, DB SQLite and DBI is a huge beast that we definitely don't want in the base system. But there was a solution, fortunately, um, kind of a MacGyver solution. Uh, we have this tool called Locate, uh, which can actually act as a simple database, means that, uh, okay, you have all those lines, usually file names, and you can put about anything in there, and uh, as long as you have a key that's part of the line, you can find stuff again. So let's try that. Uh, actually, I already used that for package locate DB, which is one of the packages uh, that you can install that will give you uh, the full list of all files produced by all packages with the package name added to, to them. And for instance, it looks like this. Like uh, if I'm looking for the IM, uh, then it will tell me uh, each package that actually contains something that starts with, uh, no, not starts, that contains uh, this path. So here you see that you have some uh, actual VM packages and surprisingly, GrabViz also has something that looks almost the same. Simple as that. You just put your update information in a locate database in formatted lines, and you can retrieve it later, and you don't have to install anything. Uh, so it's actually fairly efficient. 
Uh, I've done some measurement at the time. We had 300 megabytes of uh, uh, package locate information compressed to only 23 megabytes. Uh, it runs reasonably fast. Uh, there are some alternate uh, algorithms for locate which are much faster. I just found it in Dublin very recently. But it's good enough for us. And it is part of the base system, so I don't have to clamor to get some other stuff inside OpenBSD. You know, you said in this book, like, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, if you're not an OpenBSD developer, you haven't heard uh, Theo say that, but there is a very definitive tendency of saying, no, we won't put anything else in the base system. So uh, with respect to update info, basically, it seems to be very simple. You will create line with each uh, line from the actual packing list uh, prepended with the actual package name. And that should be it. And it compresses just fine. You start with 23 megabytes of uh, actual update information. And it compresses to only 3 megabytes. So yeah, 3 megabytes, that's about nothing considering our bandwidth uh, these days. Uh, and I gave a script that created the information to my fellow package builders. And then I got distracted by uh, day job work. <laughs> and I forgot about it, and they forgot about it. And next time I was able to try to test it, uh, the actual index was gone because they didn't bother anymore. You got to realize that uh, what I asked them to do was to run a specific script after building the packages and uploading the result on the site somewhere so that I could retrieve it. Uh, so uh, if we automate things a lot, uh, like building packages and uploading them, it's for a reason. It's so that people like Nadi can do that every three days without uh, too much of a workload. And uh, asking about anything else like doing some extra work each time, uh, it tends to be not so fun after a few weeks. So he forgot, and I don't blame him. So in order to do the test further, I had to find a way to make sure that the information was there all the time uh, before I could actually test it. Uh, and uh, we actually already had a mechanism to try to coerce packages to do the right thing. We've got this uh, really weird package called Quirks, which has been designed to contain exceptions because sometimes things get renamed, because sometimes things vanish, uh, because there are some hopeless bugs in the base distribution. So Quirks is there because we can't predict the future. And it's always the first thing that Packagehead looks at. It gets updated each and every time you try to update your base system. So I tried to put it into Quirks. And uh, I asked my friends again to regenerate a package at the end. And this time they were available, I was available, so success. We managed to get things into Quirks, and I could uh, test things a bit more. And uh, yeah, there was some uh, trepidation as to whether or not it was going to work out or not, and how fast it was going to be. Uh, so quick results. Uh, there was a big snafu with uh, some packages, so always update stuff. I'll talk about that later. I think it's Sebastian Marie who got it first. And uh, apart from that, uh, I tried to grab the update information from uh, the new uh, small database before actually going to the packages. And whoa, was it fast? 20 times at least on average. So yeah, at this point, uh, it's a good idea to try to move away from the experiment part and uh, really making it work. So what's left to do at this point? Uh, as usual, with any cache, with any cache, sorry, uh, one big issue is to make sure that you're caching the right information and that your tools are going to detect the problem if anything goes wrong. So at first there was uh, quite a lot of uh, supplementary code in Packaged 
to not trust the cache and go to the package anyway, at least as a debug uh, possibility, and make sure that things did match. Uh, turned out I was roaring for not nothing, but not much. Uh, it turned out to be surprisingly uneventful. It worked almost every time. Um, one non-issue as well is that, of course, uh, you're going to grab quirks from the same location that you're grabbing your updated packages, uh, which means that you can't cache several packages source at once. You have to cache the main source that you're using. It turns out not to be an issue again, uh, because most people are only going to grab official packages, and when you are debugging packages from someplace else, like when Robert creates a new Chrome, then usually uh, you're going to update anyway, so opening the package is just fine. Uh, so yeah, not an issue. If you want to have your own local packages, usually you're not going to grab them over the network, like they are going to be an FS mounted or something, or you can also transfer them to SSH. And uh, SSH connection has got some special code that means that packaged is really fast, even when grabbing partial packages. Uh, and finally, uh, Quirks always gets updated anytime something changes. So I got reasonably secure that I always had uh, the right Quirk package at the end. And we put that into production and life was good ever after. Except that I have a few uh, small details to talk about, but just a sec. So <coughs> this is the actual code that got put into production with some simplifications. Uh, at first, the proof of concept was we would run locate for each uh, updated package, but it turns out that at the start of packaged, I got my full list of packages that needs updating. That's actually the full set list in line one. And I can look at uh, each set that I need to update. And uh, anything that's either an older package or an indication of stuff that I need to update, see line seven. Uh, if uh, I have found an update at this point, I haven't found an update, sorry, yet at this point, then uh, I just look at the package name and uh, add that to the future run of locate. So, Line 15 here, I add the stem to the full list. Um, once I do that, I will actually uh, run locate itself, line 28, with only those stems, which means that I have one single run of locate for, uh, say, 1,000 packages that need updating. And then uh, all I have to do is to parse the output, which would be, okay, package name plus update line. So I create the update line straight into memory, raw data for this package name. And fortunately, Perl uh, has functions that uh, allows me to uh, actually uh, parse a file from uh, data in memory without uh, needing to write anything to disk. And uh, of course, I also have some uh, instrumentation in case something goes wrong. Like for instance, uh, figure out why I didn't find some update information for lots of packages. Uh, again, details, always update. Why is it a problem? So historically, uh, an always update package is something where instead of just looking at the update information, the usual update information, you're going to look at the whole packing list and if anything changes, it means you have to update the package. Like for instance, one file is not exactly the same, it doesn't have the same checksum, and it needs to be updated. One big problem is that contrary to normal update information, full packing lists are ordered, and the locate da database isn't. So if you store a full packing list instead inside the local database and you try to grab it again, 
you will get uh, pure garbage. And packing lift yelled very loudly that it was unable to parse that. So I decided to simplify the code for all the bits. Uh, move a check from package add to actually package create. And uh, now uh, there was a small transition period, but always, pack always uh, update packages actually contain just a hash of the full packing list without that specific element. And you just need to check that hash has update information. So it fits again within the framework. Woohoo, we won. Uh, one fun thing is that usually when you get something faster, you will notice that everything else is slow again. So this happened, obviously. Uh, we are supposed to store files inside a package out of order so that files that didn't change get stored near the end for faster updates. And there was a subtle bug in there. So it was much easier to see once everything else got faster. And also the next bottleneck was that actually moving files around on the file system uh, was becoming a bit of an issue because we probably have the slowest file system in existence. Uh, if somebody could kidnap uh, Kirk McCusick and bring, it over, bring him over to OpenBSD, that would help, probably. So um, I did some very horrible things to try to optimize that. Uh, to give you an idea, the code before, uh, when we updated the package, it was first uh, extracting the whole, whole package as temporary files with temporary names. It was also creating links to file uh, from the old package to the new package if it didn't change. Then it was removing every part of the old package and then it was finally moving the temporary files into the final locations. And uh, even moving metadata on OpenBSD is very, very slow. So actually figuring out when I could avoid creating temporary names and just create the files in the right location from the start, that was also a huge win. Final change was an interface one. Uh, when everything was slow, you were saying, okay, package Z is not moving, something must be happening. But now you saw that package Z was not moving and yeah, what was going on? Turns out that some packing list, when you decide to update, are go actually going to take a bit of time to read. Like, for instance, tech life, which is something like 200k files or something like that. So just displaying a message to the user that, okay, I'm actually processing this and that packing list, uh, it makes it seem like things are going faster, even though they're not. So that's a bottle about uh, caching packages. Oh yeah, that part. Uh, turns out that uh, asking people to generate quirks by hand at the end of uh, creating packages, uh, you can do that for maybe two or three weeks, but uh, sooner or later they will forget, so you have to automate it. So it was quite easy to do, it, this code just does, okay, uh, if I'm actually creating all packages from the port tree, then I'm also going to create quirks at the end, again. Uh, and it was the first version, a bit of a MacGyver version. I ended up doing it slightly differently, like these days. Uh, you can actually annotate the package to be built for later with DPB properties. Right now you only have quirks and will probably always only have quirks. So after building everything, if you find out that you have a package that is supposed to build later, then you're going to build it at that point instead of earlier. Uh, spoiler alert, it means that instead of being completely synchronous when you run a DPB for the full port three, you're going to wait maybe one or two minutes at the end until it regenerates it. Acceptable. Uh, and second part of the talk, which is a bit shorter. Uh, this code is a bit old by this point. It means uh, I've written it something like 20 years ago. And there were some experiments at the time which 
did turn out quite well, and some of the stuff which is a bit outdated and needs replacing. Uh, plus, I regularly run into people who say, hey, we don't understand your code, we would like to help, but uh, yeah, it's quirky, it's complicated, we can't do anything. So I've started actually removing all stuff and killing it, and uh, trying to write better comments about some stuff that was yeah, a bit iffy at first, and document stuff that I found out worked really well for me. One big thing that helped recently is that Perl got a huge update. Uh, uh, who is using Perl here? Yeah, I guess at least three of, of them. Perl uh, 5.46 is a huge, big change uh, in order to enlist people to help you. Uh, there have been uh, some other interesting advances, but nothing as good as that one. Uh, so Perl gets new features from time to time. For instance, yada yada, uh, look it up. I don't have time to talk about it actually. And sometimes they do stuff that's not so great, like they try to add something that looks a bit like pattern matching from MoCaml and shit like that. Uh, but uh, they did some big mistakes, so it was experimental for a few years and then it got removed. Uh, so Perl is actually several languages at once. You can activate some features by saying you are using this and this version. Uh, one big problem for us, as far as production go goes, is that obviously you can't use experimental stuff. Because yeah, sure, we started using given one, and oops, it's no longer there. You're going to have to rewrite everything. So Perl actually gained prototypes from normal pro programming languages, except they didn't call it that. Prototypes in Perl are something entirely different. They are used to create syntax that's similar to the base language. They call that signatures instead. So that makes things incredibly confusing because in package land we already have cryptographic signatures, we've got update signatures, and now we got signatures on Perl. So yeah, prototypes for normal languages. <coughs> and basically it's very simple. It's just the thing you're used to in languages like C, C++ and things. You can actually name parameters instead of having to pass them in uh, at underscore and grabbing them later in this function. This is absolutely useless, more or less, to the experienced Perl programmer. But it means that if you try to enlist new people into working with you, suddenly it becomes much simpler because they have way less of a learning curve when they try to do stuff. How much time do I have? Ah, cool, lots of time. Uh, so because of this mix up between prototypes and signatures, <coughs> if you already have prototypes, old style Perl in your code, you also have to annotate them to be able to use uh, the new version. But after that, uh, all you need to do is you need to just name your parameters within the, within the function declaration. So every prototype needs to be made unambiguous. Uh, you need to be careful about code that actually calls over code, which can be written uh, like this here. Uh, on person dollar code, uh, you need to put parentheses uh, at the end of it because on person dollar code means something else now. And also there are some, yeah, something that I seldom used anyway, which is that you need to use the arrow version of uh, actually calling the object methods with this. It's a detail. Uh, so this way of calling uh, functions uh, using just ampersand without any parentheses, it's actually useful. It's what's called a forwarder in uh, most object-oriented languages. It means that, okay, I have this method, and actually I don't want to implement it here. I'm just going to forward it somewhere else, and I don't need to care about parameters at all because they're going to be the exact same thing, right? So this is the 
only case in my code where I actually don't use the new signature syntax uh, because, okay, all I'm saying is uh, this is not the function you're looking for. Look elsewhere, you got the full implementation, you got the full prototype there, and you don't need to worry about details. All I did is that I added a comment. Uh, anybody can cares to guess why as a comment there that says forwarder? Nope. <laughs> Simply put, it's because I want to be able to grab things. I want to be able to check whether I forgot to add prototype somewhere. And uh, there are exactly two cases in Perl where you don't need or want to add prototypes, forwarders and signal handlers. Signal handlers, it's because the syntax is a bit fuzzy. We don't quite know how many parameters we're going to have. So, when in doubt, you leave it with a prototype. So the indirect syntax stuff, yeah, it's just an issue with uh, built-ins. Uh, they had the almost small talk way of uh, calling objects, where you first put the method, then the object name, then the further parameters. Um, this is still used, uh, for instance, if you have objects that looks almost exactly like the base syntax of the system, like you can have an actual file under in Perl, uh, which will work as print dollar uh, $fh, and you can have uh, an object that looks like a file under, which will be called exactly the same. So this is something they are slowly moving away from, so that the parser gets a bit simpler and less C++. So speaking of C++, uh, as usual in Perl, parameters, uh, scalar parameters start with a dollar. Uh, you can have the news parameters by just removing the name, and you can have default parameters by specifying a value. If you're used to C++, that's almost exactly the same. Uh, you can also have lists. Uh, which means that, okay, you are going to write scalar parameters, then you're going to write something that starts with an at, and obviously it will slurp every remaining parameter. Or you can even have an, an hash by uh, using uh, a percent, which means that you will check that you have the right number of parameters. And that's about it. That's as simple and as intuitive as that. Well, as far as having Perl be intuitive goes. Got five minutes or so. So the old way for those of you familiar with Perl of using uh, at underscore is deprecated now. If you have a routine that uh, has the signature and you are trying to use arroba uh, at underscore, uh, then Perl will uh, be very <laughs> unhappy about it. Uh, you might wonder why. Uh, the name reason is that uh, with name parameters, uh, it's obvious that there is an opportunity for optimization. Like if you have a routine that has name parameters, then almost certainly you don't need to uh, actually fill arrobas uh, underscore with the same parameters. So here, uh, Perl wants you that they haven't decided yet whether they want to optimize that away or um, still make it do something. So in the end, you don't mix both. And this is, by the way, this is how I found, uh, where was it? Oh, shit, sorry. Yeah, this is wh where I found that uh, calling dollar code without parentheses wouldn't work anymore because Perl would warn me that I am using our bus underscore, even in an implicit way. So, classical Perl code, uh, which is a bit longish. Yeah, takes two slides. Uh, after moving to prototypes, it looks almost like your usual programming language. So I get new victims. I can probably uh, trick new students into looking at my code and trying to improve it, which was the goal all along. 
or uh, seasoned developers report bugs to CDF because they can actually read this as opposed to the old tail syntax. Uh, so there were some best practices to find, in particular when you have unnamed routines and you are doing object-oriented stuff, uh, you need to find a way to put the documentation somewhere. Turns out that uh, just documenting the call actually works instead of trying to awkwardly put uh, names into comments on the proper line. Um, one small problem is that it took maybe two months to correct everything because there are some situations where having an extra parameter or missing a parameter won't happen in every case and you have to actually run this part of the code to be sure that uh, everything is good. Uh, and also, uh, if you have anonymous subroutines, Perl is still pretty shitty at telling you that something went wrong. Like if you look at the second call, yeah, okay, you got an anonymous subroutine, you won't know where it is, you just know that you don't have the right number of parameters. Uh, also, there's the fact that I wasn't too clean about doing things. Sometimes I have routines that take a variable number of parameters because you know the best class for its constructor, it needs two parameters, but I have a derived class that requires something more. So sometimes I didn't even bother mentioning the third parameter, but as soon as you actually get prototypes, you need to make sure that everything is mentioned. And even Perl itself uh, has issues with that, like signals. Normal signals take exactly one parameter, which is the number of the signals. But you have some uh, pseudo signal code in Perl that uh, triggers when you are warning or dying. And that code can have any number of parameters. So making sure that everything works each and every time is a bit complicated. So in some cases, I decided to delay the actual solution for later. Like you slurp all parameters and yeah, we will figure it out later. But uh, I find it best to try to fix it along the way as soon as possible. So that uh, 10 years down the line, we still don't have a legacy code that doesn't know how many parameters it has. Yeah. Uh, one cool thing you can do for, which is impossible in uh, C++, but works really nice with Perl, is that uh, sometimes you don't actually know what your default value is going to be at a given site. Maybe you have to call three methods until you end up with an object that is actually uh, owning the default value, and you can do that really easily with Perl. Because uh, you will just say, okay, I have maybe one extra parameter or not. So you declare it at the top level with a list and you, you pass the list along. And when you end up with the actual method that needs to say, okay, I don't actually have anything here and I need to create a default value, then you can do it at that point, which is really cool. So yeah, I'm actually using it here. Like I have a uh, read from file, grab playlist. Uh, grab playlist is not supposed to know about uh, packing lists. So instead of having to ask packing list for what's the default code to run when you're trying to grab a packing list from somewhere, you can just say, okay, there is a list that might contain some code. And when I get to the actual packing list reading information, then I will decide what the default value is. This is something that as far as I know is not possible to do simply as simple as that in any other language. Uh, like I said, yeah, grouping. So all my methods now have signatures apart from forwarders and signal handlers. And both of these are annotated with a comment. So I can't miss anything. Unfortunately, this is something of a limitation of Perl. Because right now, signatures are just fine, but some meta tools, uh, introspection tools in Perl don't support them. 
like Perl Critic, for instance, is going to just uh, barf over signatures. As you can see from those slides, uh, stuff like uh, pigments also doesn't like signatures at all. It looks like shit. But apart from that, it's just fine. Uh, one thing I would lo lo love to do after that is figure out um, if I've called everything in my code. Uh, again, uh, there's some code that doesn't work very well. I've tried playing with double cover. Contrarily to the Perl profiler, which is amazing, the coverage tool is complete shit. It breaks very badly on packaged and BPB in various cases. Uh, as far as I know, the main issue it has is that it's really uncomfortable with code that uh, changes identity. And I've got privilege separation all over the place in both packaged and uh, BPB. So devil cover is not at all transparent and all this code will break in various ways when you try to do coverage on it. This is really something I would like uh, possibly somebody to look at because right now it's completely broken. And yeah, well, then uh, if we can do that, we can probably uh, do some more optimization in packaged and BPB and implement some more features. But I think I'm about to run out of time, more or less, yeah. So it's time for some questions. Yeah, was it too complicated? Uh, so, yeah, I'm still going to answer anyway. Why uh, won't I rewrite it to Python? There are two, several reasons for that. The first reason is that we don't have Python in the base system. Because uh, Python is not in the base system because it's the wrong license. Yeah. Because there was no other question, so why not? And there is a deeper question, uh, there is a deeper reason, which is that uh, one, I don't like Python, and two, it's way less expressive than Perl for this kind of thing. Like uh, in Perl, you can do uh, programming object oriented small talk style, and you have exactly zero idea how you can do the same thing in Python. And the overall reason I hate Python is because it's opposite to everything that I believe. Like we have decided to take a language and dub it down until it's available for everybody and uh, every idiot can write Python code that works more or less, but we can do magical stuff with it. And I like to do magical stuff from time to time. After all, it's still a hobby, you know. Well, from time to time as well. Any other serious or non-serious questions? Okay, thank you.